Hey everybody, thank you for joining us tonight at today's Harvest Church. Uh, we're doing another Wednesday night here. Hopefully um, we'll get back on track with the Wednesday night services as time goes on. Uh, I want to welcome you be, uh, welcome you here being a part um, you know, of our service tonight. You know, we've been dealing with some of the, um, with one of the issues called spring cleaning. And uh, it's important for us to, to understand that when, when we go through physical spring cleanings, we take care of areas in our house, you know, and, and uh, you know, one of the things we talked about was, you know, taking care of your junk drawer and taking care of your closet. We talked about cleaning the corners a little bit along those same lines. And, uh, you know, so tonight we're gonna deal with our shoes. Everybody say shoes. These are important because, you know, I, I have um, one of my shoes here and I know this is gonna be nasty and we're gonna talk about this, but this is one of my favorite pairs of shoes. Now, I first got Skechers. These are called Go, Go Walks, I think it is. And, um, and they, they have this, well, I won't show you the inside much, but anyway. Um, they're comfortable and I wear these now just when I, yeah, and they stink. Pam's over there saying they stink. <laughs> but uh, I wear these because they're so comfortable for me. Do you understand? Now, I'm not supposed to wear these out in public, of course, but um, sometimes I sneak them on and I do it anyway because here's the thing, the shoes are made to wear so they fit your feet. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and uh, this is one of my favorite pair, like I said, and I, but I can't wear them out anymore. If you see the bottoms of them a little bit, you'll realize that if I go out and it's a little bit wet outside, the water just soaks right through the soles of my shoes and my feet end up getting wet and that makes it even worse. So, um, you know, we're gonna be talking about the subject tonight is foot loose and how to free or how to set your walk free. This is what I wanna deal with tonight. Not only that, how to take your Christian walk to the next level. So there's a song out and uh, it's one of Pam's favorite songs and I think one of her favorite movies and, and it's called Footloose. How many of you remember? Raise your hand if you do. And this is the way the song says. So now I gotta cut loose, foot loose and kick off my Sunday shoes. How many of you know? This is one of the things that we're gonna deal with tonight because a lot of times we wanna act different in the world than what we act in the church. So we're gonna talk about the different types of shoes that we can put on. So let's let's get right into this. And uh, some of you, I hope you took off dancing and you'll probably end up watching the movie and they need to pay me royalties if you do. So um, keep your spiritual shoes on. And that's one of the things I wanna to talk to you about. There's a saying in the world and it says this, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his shoes. I know you probably heard that. And uh, part of what it's saying is, is that before we go judging somebody, understand where they're coming from, understand the kind of life that they've had, understand what they've been walking through. And, uh, but I'm gonna take that and I wanna, I wanna relate it to the spirit where, where God took care of the same thing. You know, when we say, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his shoes, how many of you know God did this same thing? You know, even though it's a worldly saying, I wanna show you in scripture what it means for God to do that for, to us and what it did for us whenever he did that. So if you go to Hebrews chapter four, we're gonna start off in 14, we're gonna read 14 through 16. This is in the Message Bible. And, um, and God did this through Jesus and walking as a man on earth. And I want you to see this. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not, let's not slip, let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. Now, isn't that good, guys? You know, when I was growing up, most of what I heard in church whenever I went to church, and, and it was kind of spotty, you know, whenever we would go, and, and, uh, and I didn't, didn't pay attention like I should have paid attention. And, um, but one of the things that I realized that, that um, you know, we, I never heard that Jesus understood us. All I heard, and I'm being honest here, was Jesus, you know, had something against me. I mean, I went to a youth revival one time and the preacher got up in front of, front of us youth and said that if we ever disrespected our moms and dads, he hoped God would hit us in the head with a bolt of lightning and burn us down to nothing but a grease sock, spot and suspenders. And I remember, you know, it, you know, fear was what was taught and fear was what was pushed across. And as when, when I, I, I like it when I for real got saved. Let me say it like that. I love the way CJ does it. 
when I for real got saved, um, I started understanding that God was totally different than what I had heard, that God, um, you know, sent Jesus so he could get in touch with us and so he could understand us and so Jesus could walk through this life. And this is what it says. If you, if you read it in a different translation, it says that Jesus has, has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, he came and walked through this so he understands us. For So whenever I go to God now, I'm not just praying and, and hit and miss prayers. What I'm doing is I'm praying because God understands Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says he's there to make intercession for me. Because he can make intercession for me because he's walked this life, but he did it without sin. We'll see that in a little bit. But he suffered the same things that we suffered, even to the point of death, so that we could overcome this life. He's given us the victory. Isn't that good news? If you don't get anything else tonight, I hope you understand this. You need to put your victory shoes on and learn how to walk in victory. I, I didn't tie that into the message, but it, it'll probably get there at some point in time. So this is what it says. You know, we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. In other words, our feelings. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all. And then it says this, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy and accept the help. Here's the thing. God understands where you are. He understands your weakness. He understands what you're going through. But he's also given you the ability and the power to overcome these situations. And a lot of times I know with me, I, I just get frustrated and I make comments sometimes. I know y'all don't think that I do this, but I do. Sometimes I, I just get to the point to where, you know, if you're not careful, you just get to where you just don't care, man. You want whatever you're going through to be over. You want whatever you're, you're, you're having happen in your life right now just to come to an end and, and whatever it costs to get it done. I mean, I made this comment one time when I was going through a struggle um, with my business. I said, no matter what it costs right now, I'm just ready to get it over with. I just want to get it done. And see, whenever we do that, we take it out of the arena of faith and we put it in the arena of natural law. And when we put it in natural law, sometimes we take God's favor off of it. Well, what we're responsible for is staying connected, staying in truth, staying in faith, and allowing our faith to help us gain favor in these situations so that we can walk through them. Well, this is what it says. Take the mercy. Everybody say that with me. Take the mercy and accept the help. This is, this is what we were called to do. Now, that's what Jesus did. So you can see Jesus came to walk a mile in our shoes. He literally did. He came to walk in our shoes so that he could, he could overcome for us. And, and the Bible says he, he's become that for us now where we can have victory. He has shown us the way. Isn't that great? He's shown us the way. Now listen to what it says here. He made it so now we can walk, walk the rest of our lives in his shoes. He took his life, gave it for us so that he could, he could walk in our shoes. Now he turns around and he makes it so we can walk in his shoes. And how many of you know his shoes are victorious shoes? And this is good. Now listen to what it says in Psalm 18 and 33. This is in the Amplified Bible. I used a classic uh, one whenever I preach out, whenever I preach. It says, he makes my feet like hind's feet. How many of you know what hind, that's not talking about ketchup, all right? But hind's feet, basically, when you look this up, it, it's a, it, it speaks of a powerful deer, but it, it actually means it's just like the horse when it comes up on its hind legs and puts all of its strength on its back legs so it can overcome the hill or overcome whatever obstacles in it or actually to buck a rider off. Now, what happens is when, when the Bible's talking here about he makes my feet like hind's feet, what he's, what he's saying here, he gives strength to your stance. This is what he does. You have the ability to stand on your legs, to stand in the natural, to stand in the spirit, to overcome everything that you need to overcome. And I love this verse of scripture because this is what it means. When the pressure gets on you, the only way the pressure can overcome you is if you sit down and allow it to because God's made it so you can have victory over that situation. And the enemy's trying to show you how you're gonna end up being defeated, but God always shows you how you end up having victory. And that's what you gotta get in tune with. So we're talking about our shoes and how we handle ourselves. Don't forget that, we'll get back into that in just a minute. But it says, he makes my feet like hind's feet, able to stand firmly. Man, would you declare right now that you're gonna be able to stand firmly? What does it mean to stand firmly? That means you're gonna have a stance regardless of what the ground under you is doing. I, for some reason, I wanted to watch 
some of the old Indiana Jones movies, you know, and, and I forget which one it was where he's, he's having to go after the chalice of Jesus, you know, the cup. And uh, he gets to a point where it says he has to take a step of faith. And I know it's a movie, but it plays right in here. And he just, he, he can't see what's going on. So what he does was he just closes his eyes and he steps out. And when he steps out, there's a bridge there that's invisible to the eye, but you can, you can feel it whenever you stand on it. This is what faith is for us. Even when it feels like everything's sinking around us, if we will learn and we will get the word of God inside of us, then it means we will stand firmly even, even in those situations. Or this is what it says, make progress on the dangerous heights. Isn't that something, y'all? I've been in some places, I'm telling you. My, my wife and I, and, and actually me by myself sometimes when I would go door to door and we would go out and pass out tracts, you know, every time that we started a church, I've been in some places that were really scary in the natural. I mean, it really would. If you looked in the natural, um, you would go, nah, I don't think that's the right thing to do. <clears throat> but it was the right thing to do because, you know, we're supposed to reach the lost. And how do you reach the lost if you don't go where the lost are? I'm not saying that, you know, they're in good neighborhoods, they're in bad neighborhoods. So we need to, we need to reach them all. And it says this, you'll make progress on dangerous heights, of testing and trouble, he sets me securely upon the high places. Understand this, when you got God in your life and you know the word of God, we talked about this last Sunday, you know the word of God, then you can stand where others fall. I've made it a point in my life that if, if I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna fall toward Jesus. I'm not gonna fall away from him and keep running. I wanna fall toward him. So this is what it is. Jesus came and walked in our shoes so that he could give us the ability to walk in his. Now let's get in. Let's get into another part of the message. Let let me read uh, Psalm sixteen verse eleven. This is in the message um, Bible again. Now that you got my feet on the path, listen to what it says. All radiant from shining from the shining of your face, ever since you took my hand, I'm on the right way. So as long as you allow God to lead you and you allow God to be in involved in your life. You know, there's been times when I've turned to the left. The Bible says we're not supposed to do it, but I'll be honest with you. I have turned to the left sometimes, or to the left, this way. I was doing your left. This is my left. And uh, sometimes I've turned to the right. This is my right. That's your right. I guess that's the way it is. So, um, you know, here's the thing. I've turned away. I've turned the wrong way sometimes, but as long as you put God focus, bring God back into focus in your life, God has a way of putting you right back on track. Let me tell you what shoes means in the Bible. Shoes are mentioned very often in the Bible. They're usually symbolizing our direction or life path. So in other words, when the Bible talks about shoes, it's talking about how we're living, how we're walking. There's one portion of scripture, and I think we're gonna do it, uh, maybe not this week, but next week, because uh, I don't think I'm gonna get through this in one week. We will see, Christina's laughing already, um, but we'll see how I do. But a lot of times it's talking about when it says conversation, it's talking about your manner of life. So when you read the Bible, you need to go back and look at some of these words that are used in the translation because some, some of them aren't translated right. So I always study it. And I go and I look at it in the Greek and Hebrew and try to figure out, hey, how does this apply in my life? This is a part of studying. There's a difference between studying the Word of God and reading the Word of God. Now, there's sometimes when I just need the Word and I get down and I read the Word because it's refreshing to my mind and it's refresh, refreshing to my spirit. But there's sometimes, y'all, where God wants us to go a little bit deeper and we need application. Now, I apply the Word all the time, but sometimes I have to get understanding that I don't have in a situation. And that's where my word studies come into play. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a verse of Scripture and I may, I'll be honest with you, I may spend, spend a week. There's some Scriptures I, I've spent months on just studying the words and trying to gain a better understanding of them and placing them into my life because, see, I, I want the word to affect me. I need it to affect me on the outside. I need it to affect me on the inside. But also sometimes I have some character flaws. I know none of you do, but I have character flaws and I have to change the way that I view things. I have to change the way that I see things because no matter who you are, you can get stinking thinking and it'll affect you in a bad way. I mean, it'll get you thinking wrong. It'll get you moving actually the wrong direction. And God wants us on the right path. So it, when the Bible talks about shoes, it symbolizes our direction or our life path. Um, shoes also symbolize our faith, how we stand, you know. 
and, and readiness to be in service to God. So it's going to take different shoes for different things, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, in some cases, it symbolizes the protection that we receive from God and, and the desires, uh, you know, desires that God has given toward us and, and, grant, and granted us. So there's different types of shoes. Now, I showed you one of mine tonight. In case you just come on, I showed you one. This is, this is my old, old pair of shoes that I enjoy because they're comfortable. But the truth of the matter is I can wear these working out and I can wear them knocking around the house, these shoes. But they're not good for me to go on a walk with because the inside of them's broke down and the soles of my shoes are worn out. All right, so when we have our own shoes, they can be in different conditions. Your shoes will develop according to the size of your foot or according to the wear of your foot. So some of us will wear them on the side. Some of us will wear the heels out. Some of us don't know how to pick our feet up. All right, so we drag our feet as we walk. Well, our shoes will wear according to our walk. So we have to be careful of this. All right, so watch this. Um, there are different types of shoes. The first type of shoe that we're going to talk about is your shoes that you have for show. Everybody say, this is your fancy shoes. How many of you know, I, I got some shoes that I can wear whenever I do a funeral. I got some that I wear sometimes when I'm in church. But if I try to wear them all day long, they will just hurt my feet. I'll say it honest with you. My feet end up feeling like they're dying. And I, I saw somebody not too long ago, and I'm not going to mention their name, but it was a lady and they were wearing they were wearing shoes and I looked at them and I said, how in the world are you doing that? And uh, and they looked at me and said, oh, these are just for church. So that's, that's what, and I understand that because we're supposed to put our best out, put our best foot forward, so to speak. So I wanna talk about the shoes that you have for show. And these are your Sunday shoes. Everybody say it with me, my Sunday shoes. Now my daddy was a military guy. Um, I'm going to have to go back and look because he served in so many different things when he, he was in the, I know he was a sniper. I also know he was in the airborne and, uh, you know, and he never talked about it too much. But one of the things that I do, and I remember a lot about my dad, he wasn't a huggy feely type of person when I was younger, but after I got saved and my dad's life changed and he became, he became actually for real saved. I'll say it the way I said it a little while ago. Um, I remember the first time he actually gave me a hug and told me that he loved me and something changed in that situation and it was because we both of us got our feet on the right path. Now I remember this and my dad was a wonderful man. He never abused me. I mean, I love my daddy. Do you understand? I miss my daddy right now. He's in heaven and I, I, and I miss him being here. But one of the things that my daddy used to tell me, he, he told all of his children, and if others are listening, or, you know, you may even understand this, he shined his shoes because he was trained that even your work boots and even your dress shoes had to be spit shined. Everybody say spit shine. Now spit shine today means something different than it meant back then. Now when I went in the military and I went through boot camp, they made us do it the old way. I don't know whether they do that now or not, but literally what you would use is polish and it, you would use shoe polish and spit. Some of you military people out there understand what I'm talking about. But no matter what you did the day before, your shoes had to be shiny the next day. And, and my dad would always shine his shoes. I remember at night he would sit around and he would shine and he would buff and he would, he would brush those shoes until he got them perfect. And I made a mistake one day and stepped on his shoes, his dress shoes. The ones he'd spent all that time shining. I mean, if you know, it didn't go good with me. I learned real quick. The one thing you didn't do with my daddy is you didn't step on his dress shoes. All right? So we all have these shoes that we have for show. They're not comfortable. We just wear them because we want people to look at us and say, mm -mm, look at them shoes. You know, especially you ladies out there. I understand that. Well, you know, in my life right now, I'm all about comfort. I try to find shoes that I can wear and be comfortable with. And I thank God I'm in a church where I don't have to wear a suit on Sunday. You know, I'm, I'm, we're really, you know, we're really um, casual and, and that's really good. But let's talk a little bit about your Sunday shoes and, and, um, and how, how it motivates us sometimes. These shoes are the shoes that you can't use all the time, but you can use them whenever you need to use them. And in our Christian lives, we have the same thing happen sometimes with each one of us. We want to put on the robes of righteousness when we're around people who we can impress with how holy we really are and how righteous we really are. But when we get around home, we don't know how to wear it when we're at the house. And, and I've heard this said about, you know, people over my ministry to where in church they're a good person, 
but at home they're evil. And that shouldn't be the way we live our lives, guys. You know, So we're going to talk about this. How do you carry your Christian walk? Listen to this. How do you wear your Christian shoes from church into your life? And we'll, we're, we'll look at this. And I want you to look, go, to, go, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. My mind's going a thousand different ways, so bear with me. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start off in verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 8. You know, when I first laid this, this series out, I thought that this was going to be totally different. But I, had, I really had to spend the day and really seek this thing out because it's going a little bit deeper than what I, what I meant for it to. And um, I always know that God knows best and I always allow, you know, the Holy Spirit to do this. But this, is, this has been a challenging word for me because it's challenged some of my stances. It's challenged some of my, um, you know, the way I stand. You know, and, and I mean, it's just, we got to let the Word of God form in us what God wants it to form. See, and a lot of times I'm guilty of looking for the Word to fit what I'm going through. And I'm going to be honest with you, this Word is not going to be that kind of Word tonight. This Word is going to move you into position where God wants you to be. See, because I can dress and I can look really good on the outside. But if I spend all my time on the outside dressing up and cleaning up and my inside's dirty, what good does it do? I'm just putting on a show for people. And I don't want to be the one that puts on a show. I want people to see me for who I really am inside and out. So let's look at this. We're going to examine our motives a little bit. I'm going to do this in the Passion Translation. Listen to what it says in Matthew 6, starting in verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 8. Examine your motives. I could stop right there and probably do the rest of the service, but I'm not. The rest of the night, I could do it on that. Listen, listen to it. Examine your motives. Everybody say that with me. Examine your motives. Can we do it together and say it personal, make it personal? I need to examine my motives. And this is what it says, to make sure you're not showing off when you do your good deeds. Only to be admired by others, see? And then it says this, otherwise you'll lose your reward. Lose the reward of your heavenly father. So when you give to the poor, I love what it says here, when you give to the poor, listen to what it says, so when you give to the poor, don't announce it and make a show of it just to be seen by people. Like the hypocrites in the streets and in the marketplace, They've already, they've already received their reward. And then it says this, but when you demonstrate generosity, do it with pure motives. Everybody say pure motives. Now we're talking about our walk. Remember this, we're talking about how we walk for God, bringing this Christian walk out of church and walking it out in everyday life. You know, um, I, like I said, I don't want to be the type of person, you don't want to be the type of person that lives a hypocritical life where we act one way in church and they get in the world and act some way totally different because what we do is we ruin the reward that God wants to give us by the actions of our life. This is a, there's a law of sowing and reaping, so we need to be careful how we do this. It says, but you, when you demonstrate generosity, do it with pure motives and without drawing attention to yourself. Give secretly so your father who sees all you do. Isn't that good, y'all? He sees all you do. But can I do it again? Who sees all you do will reward you openly. This, this is something, guys. We're told to examine our motives and why do we do what we do? What's the reason we're doing what we're doing? You know, and I share this story in church sometimes. It'll fit real good here. If you're just trying to help people in front of you to get them out of your way so that you can get through the line faster, your motives are wrong. But if you're helping them because you're sincere in what you're trying to do, how many of you know your motives are right? Here's the difference. One way you've already received your reward. Oh, here we go. You got through the line faster, which is what you determined to do. But here's the other way. When you do it out of sincere compassion, you may not get through the line as fast, but God sees what you do. Oh, come on, y'all. Give me an amen. He sees what you do. And then it says this, what you did in private, he's going to reward you for openly. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference? You did, you did it either way. Your motives, your walk, 
your patterns, how you're living your life, how you're doing things. And I know, I told you this is going to go a little bit deeper. That's just the first few verses. And listen to what it says in verse 5. Y'all still with me, right? <clears throat> Whenever you pray, be sincere and do not, and excuse me, and not like the pretenders who love the attention they receive while praying before others in the meetings and on the street corners, believe me, they've already received their reward. When I was in West Virginia, we had a, had a guy in church, and I, I love him. And uh, to this day, I, I don't know whether he's still alive or not, but, um, you know, he, um, he would come to church on Wednesday nights when nobody else would come. When we first started in West Virginia, um, you know, it was a small work, and it began to grow and, and began to prosper. But on Wednesday nights when we first started, it was me and sometimes Richard would come, that was his name, and I was so impressed because he would just let me preach to him. I preached to one person just like there was 150 people there, you know, and he got saved so many, I'm just joking, he did not. And, uh, but, but I would preach to him and he would sit there and he would receive the word. My wife would take our two kids upstairs and do children's church. Now, how many of you know, when you have that happening, you better have your motives right because it's easy if you're not careful to get in your head. And I appreciate it so much. Well, you know, he began to grow and, and, uh, and, and one day, I didn't understand this about him, but he hated to pray in public. And I didn't know it. Nobody had shared that with me. And uh, I got him to help with the offering and he would take up the offering. And I used to ask the ushers if they would pray. He, you know, I'd let each one, one take it a service and pray for it because we had Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night services. And, um, and I asked him if he would pray. And I never will forget, you know, he, the first time he, he, um, he looked at me and he said, he said, no, no. And I went, okay, so I went to somebody else. Well, I went up to him afterwards and I talked to him. I got to make the story a little shorter, but I talked to him and he said, well, I'm just not comfortable with praying in front of people. And so I asked him a question. I said, do you pray when you're at home? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, how do you pray? And he said, well, I just talk to God. And I said, well, that's all you're doing in front of people. You're not supposed to pray fancy. Guys, just because you don't know fancy words does not, you know, fancy words don't impress God. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm real with God. I talk to God. I mean, sometimes I look, I look at God and I say, Dog, oh, God, did you see that? Man, I just can't. I mean, be real with God because he understands who you are. He knows you personally. And, and I remember he said, well, I never thought about that. So, you know, I let it go for a while. And, and one day, you know, I, I just decided to test the waters. How many of you know sometimes you got to test things out? And so I asked him, it was months later, you know, I asked him, I said, Richard, would you ask the, you know, the blessing on the offering today, on the tithes and offerings? And he said, yes, I will. And he bowed his head, and this is what he said. Lord, Father, bless the offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know I respected that out of him? And the reason why I respected that is because I knew it came from pure motives. He didn't do it to impress anybody. He didn't do it to make a show of anything. As a matter of fact, he probably didn't want to do it, but he did it because his pastor asked him to. That's even deep right there. And he was pure and he was honest. And I know God blessed that offering. See, here's the thing, guys. Whenever you pray, let's get into verse five. Whenever you pray, be sincere and not like the pretenders who love attention Love the attention they receive while praying before others in the meetings and on street corners. Believe me, they've already, they've already received their full reward. But now listen to what it says in verse 6. Whenever you pray, go into your innermost chamber and be alone with the Father God, praying to him in secret. And your Father, who sees all you do, everybody say that with me again, sees all you do, boy, that should make us walk a little different right there, will reward you openly. We're talking about our manner of life and the kinds of shoes that we're wearing. Listen to this. Why did he tell us to go in private and pray? Because there was a problem at this point in time with people getting out on the street just to be seen by men. What God was trying to teach them, what Jesus was trying to teach them is you need to have a conversation with your father and it doesn't need to be one that's just heard by people to impress people. You need to pray. You need to talk to God because it's important for you to develop a relationship with God. Now, this is what he was telling them. 
And I love this. What the Father sees you do, what, what the fa and your Father who sees all you do will reward you openly. And it says, when you pray, here we go again. He's gonna take it to the next level now. There's no need to repeat empty phrases. Man, oh man. You know, I, I, I could go on some things, you know, I, we we didn't teach our kids to say, God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. You know, we tried to teach our kids how to talk to God. We didn't want it to be just a repetitive prayer. Now, that's just us. I'm not, I'm not saying you don't need to do that. But it's, well, here we go. Let me just get into this. <clears throat> when they started taking prayer out of school, um, I had some parents come to me and they said, they said, um, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about it? And I had a different opinion of it. I, I would love to have prayer in school, but I believe we still do have prayer in school. What I'm saying is you don't have to pray openly to have prayer. Every kid who is a Christian can bow their head and pray in school, and there's power in that prayer. Now, I hate that they've taken God out of school, but the truth of the matter is school is not supposed to teach your kids how to live for God. That's your job. School should not be teaching your kids how to pray. That's the parent's job. And if you're not teaching them at home and you're expecting somebody else to do it, now you're missing what God's called you to do. All right, so this is what he says. You know, so I told the parents, I said, look, it's not the teacher's responsibility to teach, you, teach your kids to pray. Teach them to pray at home. We have to learn how to do this. He takes this to the next level. He says, don't just repeat empty phrases. In other words, I just don't learn a prayer to learn a prayer. What I want to do is I want to have communication with God. Talking and praying is conversation. That's what it is. It can actually be worship too. You know, so this is what I do. I want to talk to people for prayer in the Word of God. Nothing wrong with praying the Word. That's not what I'm talking about. But just to say something, to say something because you don't have anything else to say is do. If you got things in your life that you don't know how to pray for, number one, the Holy Spirit can lead you how to pray in, in those situations. When we know not how to pray, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and teaches us how to pray. So when I don't know how to pray, I pray it out in the Spirit. Come on, y'all, give me an amen. But there's sometimes, guys, prayer can be just sitting and letting God hear your heart. And there's been times in my life where I never uttered a word, but I had a conversation. <clears throat> and that conversation was heard. And that conversation was answered. So, um, so when we look at this, don't, don't do that. You know, don't have empty phrases praying like those who don't know God do, okay? For they expect God to hear them because of their many words, you know, and there's no need to imitate them since your father already knows what you need before you ask him. Like I was saying, you know, understand your walk is important. The way you walk your life out is valuable to you, but it's also valuable to God. Um, you know, nobody is unimportant in this thing. And, and one of the things that I've seen is that we have people in church that prayers can flow out of them. And we got some people in church that say everything they can do just to utter a prayer. You know, and, and God hears both those prayers and honors both those prayers. And, and the reason why somebody is more fluent in prayer, if I can say it that way, or they pray a little bit easier, is because they spend more time at home praying than somebody else. They practice a prayerful life. So I practice a prayerful life. I pray and I talk to God, you know, but I hold more conversations with God than I do down on my knees praying. I'll just be honest with you. So you can't impress God. You know, no word. Do you know he knows words we don't know? He knows things we don't know, but he's offered to give us the understanding for those things. So, you know, here we are. We've been talking about the shoes that you have for show, but don't let your shoes just be for show. Learn how to use them. Get comfortable, you know, I say this a lot of times in church, get comfortable in your spiritual skin. It's up to us to learn how to walk this life out. And all of us are in different stages. All of us are in different places. But also, we, we got to understand that God works with us on the level that we are. Now, pray and increase your level. Operate in faith and go to the next level because this is what we can do. So, if you, if, you know, nothing wrong with dress shoes, and I'm not saying that. Don't everybody come in ready shoes on church. Wear your dress shoes. But in the, in the spirit, understand this. You're not just called to be a showy person. You're called to be an effective person. So that's what I was trying to say in that. 
Now, what about those comfortable shoes? Here we are again. <laughs> what about those comfortable shoes? The ones we don't want to see anybody else, you know, we don't want anybody else to see us wearing. The ones that may not smell as good as what they did when we first got them. And the reason why they stink is because of us. Let's be honest. But what about those comfortable, the worn out, those stinky shoes? Sometimes, you know, they fit our feet, um, but we got to have our feet to fit his plans. This is the thing. I want to walk the way that the word says that I can walk. So when we look at Proverbs 4, and we're going to read verse 26 in the Amplified Classic Version, translation, it says, Consider well the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established and ordered aright. Now, I like this because it says one thing, consider well the path that you're on. Consider where you're walking. Now, to consider where you're walking can mean many different things. Are you on the right path? Let's talk about that one first. Are you on the right path? I mean, is this path you're on the right path? You know, I know some people that are walking in anointings, you know, walking in something that somebody else has called them to do rather than walking the place that God has called them to walk. So um, are you on the right path? And only you can know that, you know, I, I, where relationships come. Are you walking the right path? I mean, when it, when it comes to, you know, um, where you're going in life, are you walking it the right way? Um, I had, I worked for an insurance company for a while and people who had, it was door to door insurance and people who had, um, and people make good money at it, but people who had bought the insurance, they come to me at one point in time, the company did and told me, said uh, they looked at everybody's insurance policies that they had been paying on for years. I hope I don't get in trouble for this. And, um, and they looked at their cash value in their insurance policies and they issued every person a credit card against that cash value. And I remember when I was sitting in our, our meeting that morning, I, I looked at my boss and I said, I can't do that. And he said, well, you don't understand. He said, you work for the company and the company says you have to. Well, I went outside and I got in, in my vehicle. I was ready to make my route for that day. And my heart just would not let me do it. So I had all these people around me making all this money they were gaining all because we got paid so much for every one that we issued and there was no credit check because it was issued against the cash value of the insurance policy. And I thought it was so wrong to do that I did not sell one credit card. And I got called into my manager's office and, and he, he really let me have it because he said, you're the only one in our, in our whole company who was not making the sales. You're the only one doing it. He said, I need you to tell me what the problem is. And I looked at him and I said this to him. I said, it's dishonest and I will not do it. And they sent somebody out instead of me to get those credit cards in those people's hands. Now guys, listen, I got to sleep at night. That's why I tell you, I had one job in my life I absolutely hated. And it was that one. Because I'm not built and I'm not designed. Listen to this very carefully. We're not built and we're not designed as Christians to walk on certain paths. Can I get back to this? Consider well the path of your feet. See, sometimes we're forced to walk in shoes that we just cannot feel. And how do you handle that situation? Well, you always go back to the word. I don't think I've ever shared that story with the church before. You always go back to the word. You always go back to the word. And then this is, if I got to go to bed at night and I can't sleep because I've done somebody wrong or I've sold something that I shouldn't sell, guys, I'm in the wrong business. I'm just working for the wrong people. And I ended up turning in my notice after that and I quit my job and, and went and did something totally different because I got, I'm responsible for my life. Everybody say amen to that. And would you tell me, I told you this is going to be a little bit deeper. This is going to challenge you in some areas. See, <clears throat> Nobody else is responsible for you but you. And you're responsible for where you're walking. You're responsible for your life. So it says, consider well, everybody say it with me, consider well the path of your feet. And then it says this, and let all your ways be established and ordered right. So we can get into the second part of this. I covered some already, but you gotta let, you gotta let your ways be established. And the only way God establishes your ways is if they're right ways. So you got to know what the Word of God says, and you got to walk it according to the Word. And then, then God says, I'll establish your ways, 
and I'll order it right. So I want to read this again. Consider well the path of your feet. In other words, think about the shoes you're walking in. Think about how you're walking right now. Let all your ways be established and, and ordered aright. Now, I, I want to go because I want you to see this, and, and this one's going to seem a little bit out of place, but it goes right along with what we've been talking about. Let me keep up with the time here. If you go to Luke 15, and we're going to read 20 and 22, um, 20 through 22 in the Passion Translation. <clears throat> this is a... This is about the, the kid, the son, the, the prodigal son that ran away from home, took his, took his money and left, took his, took his part of his inheritance and run away. But I want you to listen to this, and I love the way the Passion Translation puts this. It says, so the young son set off for home. Now, we're coming in mid-story because the story is long, and I, I didn't know where I could fit the whole thing in. But we know he, he went to his father, and he said, give me my portion of the inheritance. He got his portion of the inheritance and he went to a land where he did not belong. In other words, he went off path. He went to an area and while he had money, this is my version of the story. While he had money, he had all kinds of friends. See, this is the way it is. When you walk according to the world, the world will hang around you as long as you can feed them what they need. But as soon as you run out of everything that you had, the world will leave you high and dry and you'll be left to yourself. So what he did when he had his inheritance Everybody hung around him, man. He he had a he lived a party life. He had a good time. He did everything. But eventually, because he didn't have the understanding or he refused to use the understanding that just because you got an inheritance doesn't mean that your inheritance keeps coming. You got to do something with what you've been given. He run out of money. And the Bible says he 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 put himself in alignment with the man in that country and began to live in the pig pen and he fed the pigs, he slept in the pig pens. Now, how many of you know he went from being, uh, uh, having a portion given to him to having nothing and sleeping with the pigs? Can you imagine how he smelt? And then we come into the story and he, he comes to his senses and he says, even my servants in my father's house live better than I'm living as a servant in this man's house. So he makes the decision to go home. Now let's catch up with the story here. So the young man set off, for home and from a long distance away his father saw him coming you know I, i'm always impressed with this because i love the fact that the father never gave up everybody say that with me his father never gave up his father constantly was going and looking for him to come home what i mean what an image of our father god god never gives up on you god never is not looking for you. God always is watching and waiting for his children to come to him. And I love this. It says, from a long distance away, his father saw him coming. And then it says these few words, dressed as a beggar. He had lost position and he came back to reality, but he still had position on him because he stepped out of his position. It's important you walk the right way. You'll see this. And it says, and great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, didn't care about the smell, didn't care about the dirt. Compassion overrides all that. And, and kissed him over and over with tender love. Now listen to verse 21. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. Now listen to what it says. The father interrupted and said, son, you are home now. Look here, we're having an opportunity tonight and somebody out here, somebody out there needs to hear this. God's saying to you right now, he's wanting to interrupt your conversation, your manner of life. This is what the father said. When the son returned home, the son was going to repent and say everything that he, was, he had done wrong. And the father said, I don't need to hear. All I need to know is that you're home. You're home. See, this is the thing that we miss. Jesus has already done the, re the penance for us. Let me say it that way. I started to say it wrong. Jesus has already done the penance for us. All we have to do is accept the gift. Isn't that good? We accept the gift 
And this is, this is why he interrupted, I love it. He interrupted the son and he said, son, you're home now. Verse 22 is where I've been trying to get to for a while now. Turning to his servants, the father said, quick, everybody say that with me, quick. You know how God does things? Well, you know, you messed your life up and it took you three years to get all messed up. So you know it's going to take you five years for God to recover you. No, nope, that's not true. That's just not true. That's just not true. Now you can hang out five years and wait on it if you want to, but God does things quick. Come on, everybody, say it with me. God does things quick. Now listen to what it says. The father interrupted him, turning to the servants. The father said, quick, bring me the best robe. Now everybody say that with me, the best robe. Did you know he didn't put a hireling robe on him? He put a good robe on him. It reminds me of what Jesus did for us. He gave, he, I, I traded my robe of unrighteousness for a robe of righteousness. Isn't that good? I, I, I handed in my dirty clothes for his clean clothes. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now. Hallelujah. Man, quick, bring me the best robe. And then he says this, my very own robe. In other words, I'm not going to just put something on you that hadn't been. Well, I want you to have mine. I want you to have the best that I have. Isn't that what God did for us? He gave us, I'm going to preach myself happy here in a minute. I have to get up. He, hey, think about this, guys. He gave us the best. He gave us the best. He gave us his own self. And it says, and I will place it on it. And he didn't even expect his son to dress himself. This is what he said. I'm going to do it for you. What an image of what Jesus did for us. I, I got the robe and I'm going to put it on you. All you have to do is turn the right direction and I'm going to dress you in my robe. Man, oh man, does that not excite me. I'm going to dress you in my robe and not only am I going to do it that way, I'm going to put it on you and let you know how valuable you are to me. I mean, let you know how important you are to me. My goodness, I got to find my place. Listen to what it says. I'm going to give you my very own robe and I will place it on his shoulders. And then he says this, bring me the ring. Good Lord. Bring me the ring. In other words, what is the ring? That's the seal of the family. This is what it was, the seal of sonship. I, I got to settle down, y'all. I got to settle down. And I will put it on his finger. <laughs> I love this. This is what he says. Uh, bring me the ring too. Bring me the signet ring. Because, you know, it's not enough to hand it to him and tell him, here's your ring back. See, motives is everything. This is, what, this is what the father's, I'm about to get, oh man, this is what the father told him. Said, here's, here's the ring and placed it on his finger, restoring him, restoring him. And it says, bring that ring, seal of sonship, and I'll put it on his finger. And I love this. Are you ready for this, guys? And bring out the best shoes that you can find for my son. Listen, guys, I have to wear different shoes at different times. Did you know this? When I go to church, sometimes I wear dress shoes. When, I'm, when I climb a mountain or when we go for a hike, I don't climb mountains anymore, but when we go, a, go for a walk in the mountains, I don't wear dress shoes because they're not fitting for me to do that with. But what I do is I put on hiking shoes, all right? When you're running, how many of you know you don't wanna go running in high heels? If you do, you're crazy, but you put on the shoes at that point in time that fit whatever environment that you're going to have. And in the natural, that's the way we do things. But in the spirit, it's also the way God built us. There's been times, y'all, where I had to step into positions. And, you know, I shared this story with church. We, we volunteered one time to cook a meal uh, at a homeless shelter in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we thought we were going to be cooking with other people. And when we got down there, the people showed us where everything was in the kitchen and said to us, okay, y'all are the only ones that are doing this. And we, I forget what it was, it was over a hundred people that we fed that night. And we had just a few hours and we had to fix food for them. So how many of you know, we had to step into some new shoes. Now, thank God for the anointing. And, and I need to say this right now. Sometimes the anointing guys is to clean a toilet. Sometimes you can be anointed to cook a meal. Sometimes you can be anointed to preach the gospel. Sometimes you're anointed to get down in the mud where people are. Your shoes, God has shoes to fit you and anointings to fit you for whatever you have to walk through at that point in time. Well, when they showed us, they had, they had some stuff for salad. They had some desserts already fixed. And all we had was some fillets of salmon, I think it was. And, uh, and I, I just, I took those things out. We thawed them out as fast as we could. 
uh, I seasoned them down good. We put them in the oven. We fixed meals. We had we had a salad. We had a, had other things, and we fed. I forget how many it was. I think it was over. I, I, for some reason, 109 people come to mind, but it was over 100 people, and none of them went lacking. I just kept things flowing. I just kept it running. And when we got done, how many of you know we were exhausted? But when I got out, I realized something. You know, when I was in the military, I was on a howitzer, but I didn't have anywhere that I could go up and rank. And listen to this. I couldn't, I couldn't go up and rank anymore. So the only position that they had where I was was a cook, and I could climb in rank so I could get better pay. So I thought about it, and I switched over. This was before I got saved to being a cook. So part of my responsibility at, at, for the last three, two or three years that I was in the military is I had to prepare food or help prepare food for 150 people. And all that just came back into me, all that that I had done just come back into me. And I remembered things that I never remembered, you know, up until that point in time. So we were able to do that. We were able to accomplish that and between me and Pam. And I, I think we just had one kid with us at that time. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, but we did all this with just us and served all the food. And when we got outside, I remember we looked at each other and we were totally exhausted, but man, were we fulfilled. God anoints you to take care of whatever it is you're doing. Never look at the task that God gives you as being, you know, something unimportant. Everything that God asks you to do is important. He says this, Put the best shoes on his feet. Man, did time get away from me. Put the best shoes on his feet. Put, let, let's, give him, let's restore him right back to where he was. So we're talking about how, how do we accomplish everything that God wants us to accomplish? Well, we do it by submitting to what God's asked us to do. Here we go. Submitting to the word of God. Come on, y'all. Give me an amen. People don't like this word anymore, but it's still true today. But also, also, Allowing that anointing when we step into that position for God to anoint us to fulfill what he's asked us to do. You know, I, I, I step in many different shoes sometimes and God always provides. God always anoints. God always takes care of us. So now let's go in, let's go into the last one that I got here. I'm going a little bit further with this than what I thought. Um, you know, and but we got work shoes, and we'll, we'll probably cover this some next week, so let, just let me get it started. Um, work shoes are built for getting the job done. So God has things that he can do to get the job done, and a lot of times we just need to step into that. So I want to read this first scripture, and I'll close it down for tonight, and then we'll begin, we'll begin here again next week because I knew I wouldn't be able to finish this in one week. Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And most of us know this verse of scripture if we've been in church, but I want you to do this as homework. I just want you to allow the, the Holy Spirit to open up this verse of scripture for you because we're going to take it all kinds of different directions next week. And it says this, so when the Lord saw that he, Moses, turned aside to look, it says God called to him from the midst of the burning, from, from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. That's important. We'll get into this next week. Then he said, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. This is one of the things that God wants us to understand. We don't have to walk out his calling in our life according to our own ability. Sometimes we have to step away from our own shoes so that we can step into God's shoes. To be able to accomplish everything that God says that we can accomplish. Hey, I hope you got something out of this tonight. Let me pray for you. You know, it's important. We're, we're cleaning some things up. I tell you guys, God's doing some awesome things. And I'm really excited about the direction that he's leading me in. And I know that he's leading some others in the same way, man. We're seeing, we're seeing things begin to break loose in the spirit and, and seeing things begin to break loose in people's lives. And you need to be excited about what's, what God's doing at this point in time. And I've, been, I've gone about an hour here. So let me pray with you. And, uh, and then I'll pray, with, you know, pray in case anybody out there needs to accept Christ. So Father, I thank you for your word. I say this all the time. I thank you that your word is true. I thank you it accomplishes everything that you desire in our lives. You send it in these vessels. 
and it'll not return into your void. It'll accomplish everything that you please and it'll prosper inside of me. Would you say that with me, guys? Your word will prosper inside of me. Not only that, God, it'll not return void. It's going to do everything that it's supposed to do. I'm good ground. It's been planted in good ground. And I may it take root and grow and prosper in my life. Now listen, if you're out there right now and you've never asked Jesus, Jesus to come into your life, I'm just going to share a verse of scripture with you. I'm going to do it a little different tonight. It says this, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to know God loves you. You never prayed a prayer to where you said, you know what, God, I accept your love. I know it's unconditional. I can, there's no way I can be perfect in my own power. But I thank you. Just do this with me. Say right now, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I accept the gift that was given, the price that was paid. And I thank you that I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I believe it inside my heart and I confess it with my mouth. And now Jesus is my Lord. And I thank you that I am saved. How many of you know that's a powerful thing? In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, please, please get, in touch with us, get in touch with us. Do it through our Facebook page or you can do it through our web page. Um, God bless you. I want you to know we're praying for you. We love you and we'll see you Sunday.